It's another episode of the Better Learning Podcast. I always like having a variety of conversations, and that's why we wanted to bring in Laura Smiles and Emily Wright into this. They, they have a bunch of different perspectives around everything that we talk about, about de designing schools and student-centered. So first, Laura, Emily, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So, so what? I'm going to start with with Laura here, and then we'll move to Emily. What, give me, give me your background. What, what was, what was school like for you? Oh wow. Um, so my mom is a teacher. So, um, I, you so, know, that sounds like, you know, like you would get ahead. Um, but honestly, it was a lot of pressure uh, to to be successful academically, and I was not. Um, I really struggled, um, especially with reading comprehension, that sort of thing. And it wasn't really until architecture school that it was really like project based learning, really kind of going at your own pace and really tinkering with something and letting your brain um, go at its own pace that things really click for me. So it was really late in life that, you know, architecture found me. Thank God. OK, how about, how about for you, Emily? So um, I feel like I could be a professional student. Like I am probably the most, you know, neurotypical in that respect. My, my kids always say, mom, you're so neurotypical. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I like, you know, I, I had that system down. I could, I could do it the way that my brain worked, the way that I was able to regulate in school. Um, everything clicked for me. Uh, when I got out of school, then it was a little bit harder because, um, it was, it was not that system that I knew mm -hmm. and that I knew how to get ahead in. And there were a lot of skills actually that I needed to use out of school that I did not get in school. Um, so yeah, I guess maybe like opposite of Laura where, yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's interesting to hear that because that is a really good way to go. But you, Emily, you also went architecture. Yes. Right. So, yes. so coming here, so um, Emily, you did well in school. Laura, you struggled, but came from a, from a family of teachers and mm -hmm. education. And then you, you both decided to go architecture. What, what, what was, uh, what was the moment then when you got into architecture where you either got forced to work on schools <laughs> or, or you made the choice to work on schools? What, how, how did that happen for you? Uh, Emily, do you want to start or? Um, sure, I can start. <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, I just kind of fell into working on schools when I came to work at our current firm, uh, Grimm Parker Architects. It was, it was a really uh, like timely experience for me because um, when I started working at Grimm Parker, it was 2016. So I had a 10 year old, no, I had an eight year old and, and a four year old. So they were all in like those elementary years. And so um, I was, it was, I, it was, I was seeing things from both ends. Like I was seeing things as a parent with my kids in school and what their school environment was like. And then I was seeing the design process of what was going on for new schools. Um, so that was, uh, that was really great to have both of those perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I was being able to like have kids go through it as I'm like learning the industry is so helpful to be able to do that. How, how about you, Laura? So um, I st also started at Grammar Parker. I really started in a different studio, in a library studio. I also was doing a lot of marketing um, and graphic design and pulling things together for all different kinds of teams. And one day um, somebody from our K-12 studio kind of came downstairs and said, hey, I need somebody to come with me to a meeting tomorrow. Um, it's to write an ed spec for Baltimore City. And I was living in Baltimore City at the time. So, um, and I, I didn't know what an ed spec was, truly had never even heard of it, but I knew that it was my city and I'm, I'm fine, you know, kind of helping out the team. So that sounds great. Um, and so we're sitting in this room with a ton of educators and we're asking questions and it wasn't until then that I realized actually I had a lot of applicable knowledge because I've spent a lot of time in classrooms and with teachers. So I knew exactly kind of how to talk to them in the language they needed and how to make them feel comfortable. And I remember leaving that meeting and one of my mentors, you know, we got really close after that because she was like, wow, um, I really wish we had talked at all about this. This was just really kismet that, you know, kind of I ended up there with her and, um, and it was really great. Just really ever since then I've been hooked. I just think there's so much to be learned and to be kind of, you know, folded into the design process, talking to educators and they don't often get the platform or even kind of feel empowered to have the voice. So sort of making them feel comfortable building a relationship and then amplifying that to like the nth degree has just been a really, um, I don't know, just really impactful experience for me. It's been great. Well, one of the, one of the topics that got us connected with it was 
talking about neurodivergent and, and designing. Talk through that, that evolution. Like why, why, why did that become so prevalent? And what were the things that you recognized as you were going through your, your jobs working on projects? What were those moments? So I think for me, um, all, everyone in my family, my immediate family is neurodivergent except for me. Um, so that, my... That's why you get called out. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> right, right, right. I, that is why. Um, yeah, so uh, everybody in my family, my husband and my three kids, all ADHD, and um, my eldest is autistic. And so um, I was you know, working through that process of advocating for them, figuring out what their wish issues were at school, figuring out what they needed, communicating with the teachers. And I was really seeing where their environments were not supporting what they needed. And so it just became extremely clear to me, just looking through the lens of my children um, and then thinking like, well, why don't why don't we do this? Or why don't we do it more? Because then sometimes, sometimes we do do some of these things that are very helpful, but we don't do them across the board. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really what started me on, okay, well, what does the research say? And what, you know, what, what things really help people, what things help autistic people, what things help people with ADHD, what things help and help dyslexic people. And, and, and then generally realizing that there's a lot of things that are in common in that group, and mm -hmm. they actually help everybody. Um, because we're all we all like to learn in certain ways. And we all experience the world in our own unique ways. Mm -hmm. And so when we're thinking about that and trying to cast a bigger net, um, it ends up being beneficial for, for everybody. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I think um, when I was raising a, a small children and kind of learning their, how their brains are working, how my attitude kind of changes that, how our environment changes that, right? So like, you're sort of like living that in real time during a pandemic in 900 square feet. And um, you, you start, you get real comfortable um, with that. Um, I, and so I'd say like kind of in a, in a similar vein, I think through the pandemic, so many, especially young people developed language and a way to articulate what they were feeling, what felt different and gave, they, they were given like a name to those things. And so they could sort of explain what they're feeling, explain what they would like to be feeling instead and, and how the space is impacting them. And I think we talk a lot, you know, about, of course, teacher feedback and admin feedback, facilities feedback, but we've been focusing more on student center, student voices of, you know, sort of asking them. And honestly, it's it's led by them. I mean, they're so much more articulate than even certainly than my generation, I'm sure generations before us, but they're, they can easily say it's too loud there right now. I can't focus at that. That's not the kind of feedback we were even getting 10 or 15 years ago. That's just not something that ever been, anybody would even volunteer for information. So it's, it's really responsive to the students that we're trying to teach and that's ultimately you know our stakeholders that we're we're all on the same page about you know trying to meet yeah th that's funny you say that I, I distinctly remember sitting in a school conference room with an administrator about 10 years probably about 10 years ago mm -hmm. and um and we were talking about you know like the need to change like break that status quo of like hey you have an opportunity to do something new do you really want to do kind of that same model anymore and you know, and, and I just remember him watching him like try to process it. And he's swiveling in this chair back and forth, like right. really, really hard. And he's like, yeah, I, I, I see your point. Maybe we should do like one, one, one there. Yes. For those really severe ADHD yeah. person. And I'm just like watching him. Move. <laughs> I'm, yeah. like, no. I'm like, if you, if we could actually design for that. <laughs> Maybe give it, one move. Every, everyone wants to move. Almost <laughs> yes. everyone wants to. Yes. So if we can actually design the, those elements, it actually benefits everyone uh -huh. in there. Yes. So uh -huh. yeah, that, that was the one that I'm like, oh, like <laughs> if I could just like record this and show it back to him, it, it would make a lot more sense. <laughs> we should find him. I bet he has given you know kind of yeah. been saturated. Yeah. I mean, the, obviously, the, over the, the last ten years, we've seen you know yes. we, we've seen a lot of changes. I, I mean, do you, do you mind talking through a little bit of like, what, what do those design, like what looks different now versus when it was 10 years ago when those conversations were either just starting to happen or weren't happening? Wow. I mean, I would say 
It has two, like, I guess, again, two things. One, the way teachers are, were taught to, like, what they wanted their classrooms to look like, because that's how they were trained, right? There was a good way to learn, and that was quiet and still. And if your room wasn't quiet and still, then you weren't doing a good job. You weren't doing a good job on evaluations. You weren't, you know, managing your classroom appropriately. Nobody was going to be meeting test scores, all of the other things. The metrics all kind of aligned with quiet and still. And now it's all about choice. It's providing, you know, kind of student-led learning, being able to they being able to understand that they can achieve those outcomes on their own chat path and on their own plan and allowing flexibility for that. And it's not only that teachers are now kind of shifting their pedagogy and kind of education to be able to sponsor that and equip them with the tools to be able to foster that kind of environment, but it's also that there's a level of comfort now for everybody, even our more seasoned teachers who were like, okay, you can move a little bit. You could talk a little bit. This is, com it doesn't have to be discussion time. We can, we can talk and it's okay. You know, like it's, everybody's kind of developing a level of comfort with it. And now things are looking and sounding different in the classroom. I think, Emily, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I, I would, I would agree that there's definitely seems to be this, um, this idea that one size doesn't fit all and that we are going to, we are going to be, you know, looking out for this kid and what do they need and mm -hmm. and what can we do to, to help them get that in, in the context of a bigger classroom. So that's what I see definitely with my own kids, too. Yeah. Right, Emily, could, could I step on some toes here? Sure. So, so we can talk about this design wise. What's your experience been actually on, oh, yeah. uh, on the school side? On the school. Yeah. yeah so like, like uh, how how are they? Yeah. Uh, what? What's that interaction been like? Yeah, so like as far as their physical environment or as far as just oh, like... More so of like what, what like, do you see, like when we, we can talk about this and, you know, even as school leaders when I have this, yeah. there's, there's a lot of talk about this, but then there's like the actual in practice that mm -hmm. I think from the parents' mm -hmm. perspective may not mm -hmm. always align with with what we hear at conferences. Right, like like about how they're working with, with my kids. as, as mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um, I'm going to say that like I'm extremely privileged to be where I am and my kids go to public school. Um, we have the means to be live in an area that has a very good public school. And we also had the means to like pick our house to be in a good part of the area that has a good public school. Right. Um, and so I have found them to be very willing to work with me. Um, at the same time, uh, they are working within what they have to work with, right? So they have the classrooms that they have, they have the staffing that they have. Um, they're really doing what they can for the for the most part, um, but it, it's it's just limited with the system that that we're in. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, we we've had so our oldest. Um, we had moved when he was going into fourth grade. So we were switching schools and we always knew like he was, you know, told he needed to do summer reading and he needed kind of interventions on reading. And then we get how in fourth grade and you always hear the fourth grade is like that moment where, you know, the switch from learning to read to reading to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was identified real early in the year by his, you know, his main teacher, like, Hey, something's up here, you know, like, Clearly has a high IQ. He's he's doing really well in math, but his reading is, you know, below a third grade level. And we, we spent like that whole year going back and forth of him getting pulled out, getting more intervention, saying, well, let's wait a little bit longer, let's wait a little bit longer. Like a, a very common story that I've heard over and over again around the country on there. And then um finally by the end, to your point, Emily, like we we're very privileged that we can be like, all right, if you're not going to test them for dyslexia, mm -hmm. we're going to test them because mm -hmm. you can call someone and they can mm -hmm. be like, you can get to test it if you want, but I can tell you like 99% what you're explaining is he's most likely dyslexic yeah. in there. But we went the entire year uh -huh. <laughs> going, going that going route. Going around and around. Yeah. 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 To do that. And, um, you know, and I'm, you know, and I'm working in education. I'm like very like, you know, like recognizing like, Tune hey, in. this is really hard. Like yeah. you're yeah. doing this, but also as a parent being like, come on guys, like I, I, I get it. But you know, like what's going on? I mean, to the, even talk to teachers, um, you know, like our, 
our other one was in kindergarten at the time and talking about we're as we're learning about dyslexia of them saying like hey it's very hereditary so you know if you, your other ones like look at it and um and we talked to her kindergarten and she, and she goes oh i've never had a dyslexic kid and i'm like what <laughs> I'm like everything we just learned research is like it's like something like ten to twenty five percent of kids. Just, yes, are, just, just yeah. a lot of and there. So and, and she had been teaching for a long time. So I'm like yeah. clearly, the, you know, like there there's some disconnect in there. Um, so I I don't want to go spend too much time kind of going down that path, but the, there is a disconnect, um, you know, be, between what I feel like we're hearing versus what's actually done in practice. And, and that's why I'm always like, hey, we, we need to be talking about this. Like we need to, we need to do this because I, I don't think the parent voices are always heard or they're heard just as complaining and. Or, in the, in the you term, know, yeah. from, from their side, there are more, prominent issues more sort of yeah. you know students who need a yes. higher level of yeah. intervention yep. or whether it's intellectual behavioral um and they only have so much exa yep. exactly like emily said i only have staff and resources and it's it's impossible to hear that as a parent and be like what do you mean right i sure. and i think that again going back to the privileged part there are, you know, kind of subsects of the country that can just say, well, I'll get you a tutor and we'll sort of close the gap at home or I, I'll take time and, you know, kind of teach you how to read after school. Whereas like the reality for so many families is not, neither of those things are on the table. And I, I mean, that's like kind of why the gap is getting wider and wider, even though everybody's trying to do the right thing. It's just, it's really disheartening. Yeah. And that is the hard part because there is no doubt that the intent is to do the sure, right thing. Sure, exactly. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's just, to your point, Emily, like the system and the resources. And yeah, like... and you know, even even me in my great location, I've I've had to get in there and say, no, you're not going to stop services from a kid. Yeah. Um, you know, like, because they're, you know, oftentimes like a little on the border, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're they're pretty smart. They're doing OK. And but but as a parent, you see actually know what they're doing is helping my kid and they need to keep doing it. Um, but yeah, and, and that is like, you know, my mom was also a special ed teacher. So like, I've been in this like zone, like Laura for a long time. It, but even for me, it was hard sometimes to go in and advocate for my kid because, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of wondered, well, maybe, maybe these other kids do, you know, do need more support than my kid does. And am I doing the right thing? Um, but ultimately, you know, it's like, yeah, we're going to we're going to keep the services in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It, it, it's hard as a parent because I don't want to be the I, I, I remember the story where um, I was friends with with a principal of a school and I was and I was meeting up with her um, and it wasn't our it wasn't the school that our that our kids was go, were going to. And, and I told her, I'm like, oh, I was that parent. Uh, like I, I sent an email to the principal. <laughs> today and i and i'm like but don't worry i said at the beginning of like hey i'm not the type of parent that complains or like gets involved like i like you guys are like we totally See, trust also. you guys <laughs> and, and she just looks at me and she goes every email i get starts <laughs> <laughs> yes i love that i love that so much everybody thinks they're not, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> however yes i love that so much yeah yeah so, so let, let's talk a little bit more about those spaces. Like, like what are those tips? What are those things that like it, from your experience that if it's school leaders in here or, you know, like you're designing a new space, like what are those elements that you're looking at or the questions that you're asking to kind of spark this conversation? Uh, Laura, do you want to? No, start? no, you go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, I, you know, I feel for me, I, your, your anecdote about, the swivel chair. Um, I, I feel like movement is so, so important. And um, recognizing that it's not a misbehavior, it's a need. And being able to accommodate that, um, you know, in the school environment is, is really, it can be really helpful. Um, you know, like the the, the wiggle chairs and the, the movement seats. I mean, I just I wish they were everywhere because I know it would help mm -hmm. so many kids. Um, and I think especially for ADHD kids, like movement is a really, 
a really big deal. Um, yeah, so that's something that I think is is a good is a good place to start looking at that because it can be done with furniture, you know, a classroom layout, those kind of things that are a little less intense than like a new building. Um, and you know, the other thing I think that that I really think about are um, when we're talking about sensory issues and sensory processing is acoustics. I think acoustics is like kind of the hidden <laughs> factor sometimes where, um, you know, we don't see it on our drawings. We don't talk, we don't really think about it sometimes. Um, I mean, as architects, we should be thinking about it. Uh, but you can have really, really harsh acoustical environments in schools. And that can be, it's, it's really hard for everybody. And it's especially hard for kids that um, process sounds differently, um, where it could be so invasive that they can't eat or they can't enjoy an, an assembly or something because the, the noise is just so intense. So those yeah. are things I think about. Same. I would say like number one is acoustic. I think that's the biggest bang for your buck for sure. I think not only to make sure that students are like having a good experience and receiving the content and, you know, kind of having an equitable learning experience, but it's just not exclusive to students. You know, there's like this quote that's kind of like wandering around online right now that was like, I heard too many sounds and now I'm a bad mom. Um, <laughs> I feel that, Laura. I, I can't really, I, if there are too many noises happening, I, I can't process anything, and now I'm a jerk. So maybe everybody needs to cool it. Um, I think that that is the case for so many educators as well, so many admin folks, so many people that are in the room, and it just makes it really hard. I mean, some people can't even identify where the noise is coming from. Um, and so they don't even know, like, it, even if it is a student who is, you know, kind of talking out of turn or that sort of thing, if there's too many noises, you can't even isolate that behavior to, to give like a, a slight intervention, a slight nudge the way you want to. It's just, if you have a room that can, you know, that the, it's the right type of noise, I hate to say that, the right type, wrong type of noise, that it just makes it so much more enjoyable and easier to manage everybody kind of experientially. Um, I'd say also, and this is like sort of a nitpicky thing for me, visual clutter is something that is um, very stimul overstimulating for so many students, so many educators as well. Um, it feels good to love on your space. It feels good to kind of make your classroom your home. But if those that's overstimulating all of your students, it makes it incredibly difficult to focus their attention kind of throughout the day. By the, by the end of the day, they're sort of like totally tapped and it doesn't matter what you're going to tell them, how, how important it is, how many times you've told them, it's just never going to break through. And so that's something that I think both in the classroom and in common spaces that, you know, picking your moments, you know, having color in one place, having something that's exciting and kind of, you know, a journey throughout the space, but it doesn't have to be everywhere, everything, everywhere, all at one time to be special and exciting. Yeah, the, there's, there's definitely yeah, trying to break through that, that idea of the teacher is going to go decorate their classroom. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and unfortunately, I feel like sometimes TikTok and Pinterest and all those are, are not helping the nope. teachers because nope. they can almost get in these competitions back where instead of, yeah, of how can we drive home that point instead of decorating, how do we design those spaces mm -hmm. differently? Mm -hmm. Like that message cannot be amplified enough. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, like I, I do think there's an element of like that is the in some ways the most rewarding thing for for some teachers is to be able to like own their space and de yes. you know, mm -hmm. yes. decorate it to mm -hmm. now be like hey you're actually doing you know you might exactly really be doing it yourself a disservice yes yes uh, yeah that, I I haven't I mean that would be a really interesting one maybe to have some teachers on it and talk about that like is there even like any discussion about this as you're going through school through you know through college of like it, I don't know if there is or not. I don't know if there is either. I, I feel like actually this is, um, you know, sort of anecdotal, I guess, but I was reading on a subreddit for teachers that it's actually swung the other way, that they're still decorating everything, but it's all in like millennial gray, pink, that kind of mm. thing. And so it's still really one note. It doesn't, it's still not driving you anywhere. It's still not impactful, but it's still like kind of over decorating. I don't know. It's, I, I thought that was like so interesting. I was like, well, but that is less stimulating. <laughs> like, okay, maybe we're, we're nudged the needle a little bit, but I don't, I don't, I didn't give any examples, which is unfortunate, but. Yeah. Uh, acoustics are interesting. So I, hearing that it's always like a mystery to me, like I, I because I, I think it's complicated. So I, um, I agree with you, like, 
the acoustic panels and things like that. Like I, I, I know it makes a big difference, but I don't mm-hmm. even know where to start. Like, like to do that because I do think there's like, like I've seen people who are like really smart and they understand um, all the sound and how it gets absorbed and where you need to place things and what, what, what are the things that, that you're seeing? Like, are you, is it more walls? Is it more things coming from the ceiling mixture of all of that? Like how do how do you handle acoustics? Yeah, I'd say it's a mixture of all those things that you just mentioned. I think we also used to rely a lot on carpet and now from a hygienic standpoint, we're standing a little bit away from carpet or having, you know, just a carpet tile, like a like carpet rug instead of the whole room being carpet. But um, having different, you know, kind of ceiling treatments that can also provide visual interest is really helpful. Of course, acoustic panels and like having, you know, like your actual pieces of furniture have acoustic um, impact as well. Sound masking is also really prevalent. Um, I feel like even eight years ago, we were talking more about, you know, kind of microphones to make our teachers louder, less so about toning the ambient noise down so they could talk at a normal volume. And I think that is something that, especially in our renovations, providing just like a little bit of white noise to tune out ambient noise. And then that way you're sort of in the room and you can still be conversational when you're talking instead of having to talk louder how, and kind of- How are you doing that? Everything. Are you like feeding that through a, a system yeah. or is Ex- it like or through, just like Exactly like a PA, like, or having okay. like a kind of um, a, a source that is in your room. Yeah, so interesting. I mean, I think the other thing with, with acoustics is um, what we call the acoustic load, which is mm-hmm. like, how much noise is being generated in this space yeah and um you know so a cafeteria you can have great acoustic treatments on the ceiling on the walls um it's still going to be a noisy place it won't be as terrible as if you didn't have anything and the sounds just bouncing around um but one thing that we advocate for is um can we break some of those spaces up can can we have some outdoor dining like outdoor dining is a blessing for people who can't handle a, a, a noisy cafeteria and so just lowering that load by breaking things up where we can is another strategy that we can do yeah uh, is, is there because i see a lot of designs that you know they're open space you know two two three story um a lot of the you know like the yeah, the, the learning steps um on there like I, what what are your thoughts on that? Like, does is that helpful or is that one of those things that contributes or makes it harder? I, I... That's one of those things where you got to prioritize, right? Are you, do you want a space where some students can informally gather? And is it more important to have that as a resource that from a pedagogy you need versus having, you know, kind of quieter areas where that learning could happen? I think it adds a lot of energy to a building. It sort of like gives it a, a milestone, a place, kind of a gathering moment. Um, but it's, make no mistake, like you're not doing anything acoustically sound. <laughs> it's something <laughs> like that, right? You just got to know that that's, that's not what, that's not the, the need that you're meeting by doing that. But it's not the only place they run, right? That's not um, kind of, that's not where they're doing even the primarily, you know, kind of their learning space either. So yeah, I think it's it's sort of judging those things and every staff and every community has to to choose, you know, what they would rather have. Emily, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree with that. Um, I, I think one thing that we talk about in our in our paper is that um, a, a strategy that is quite successful is to have a kind of smaller space that's on the edge of a larger space. So that could be like some booth seating or could be like, you know, some adjacent areas that are, you know, maybe in a smaller room, but you have a visual connection to the, to the larger space. And that, um, you know, you can still sort of be like in the mix a little bit, you're still seeing what's going on, but you've got some protection and some separation. And, um, and there's a lot of different ways you can do that. And I think that's a strategy that can work for that situation. Yeah, it's still right. supervisable also. So, you know, kind mm-hmm. of more yeah, that's true. You know, safe to do. Yeah. Are are you seeing and utilizing a lot more of like kind of like nooks or kind of more like privacy areas where maybe it's just one or you know, or a few people can utilize mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Both yeah, in our K twelve spaces and, and beyond that. I think mm-hmm. um as much as we are financially able to work those things in, um, we definitely do it and we've definitely, you know, hacked our own stuff together with no work um <laughs> to, to try and achieve the same thing. Um again, it's really that supervision piece. It's you know, when you get up to high school, it's a little, you know, kind of more independent. 
But, you know, our elementary school kiddos who are, you know, some of the most overstimulated, there are some kind of jurisdictions that are a little more apprehensive about giving them kind of like what they perceive as like a hidey hole to go kind of hide in. Yeah. Um, and so you got to do that in a way that makes it feel very organic and natural and an opt in to I'm going to, you know, kind of step away and take a second and maybe rejoin when I've um, regulated myself a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely, um, you know, we, we use this nook like a company nook like they're mm-hmm. they're mobile and yeah we, we use them like at at conferences where we'll record the podcast oh there. nice and it is amazing how you yeah. can put this in like this loud area and then you just go in here and you know everyone's first reaction the second they sit in there is like oh like this is nice i can have like a private conversation here even amongst all all the noise and Yes. Yeah. Every time I'm like, I'm like, man, these should just be all over schools because I know. they're yeah. mobile. I you know. Can, you know, yeah. you can use them throughout the day. You know, you can put them in, you know, like more in the areas, like even for like sporting events where people can go and take phone calls and mm-hmm. things. So, yeah, I, I'm always, yeah, I, I'm always amazed at just seeing kind of everyone's reaction and how powerful those are of like, wow, this can really be used in yeah. a variety of ways. Especially the mobile ones that you can kind yeah, of move from mobile, space to space. Yeah. yeah so smart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what other, what other things do you think people should be thinking about while, you know, whether, you know, they're getting an opportunity to do a new build or a renovation or just in somebody's like existing, um, things, anything else that you think they should be thinking about? Yeah. I think I've only touched on it a little bit, that kind of concept of prospect and refuge, you know, those, those little hidey hole places, of course, acoustically are helpful, but there is a sense of enclosure when, that that makes you just feel a little bit safer and again helps with that regulation helps with kind of being able to get back into your own body a little bit before you rejoin um regularly regularly scheduled activities um and that doesn't have to be a a nook this is like perfectly timed it doesn't have to be a nook it doesn't have to be something like that but they make all sorts of really um approachable achievable financial casework options or just off the shelf lecture learning stuff like things that you could just buy piecemeal and just start adding into your spaces seeing how your students react and then kind of making a bigger investment later we have a lot of um, success with our jurisdictions that will do sort of a new instead of maybe a full-scale renovation we'll do you know a two million dollar furniture package for the whole building and then they can kind of pick a bunch of pieces and then the teachers get to choose oh i like this i like that this is gonna work for your room this works for my room and then they're sort of enabled to make their own choices about what's going to work for for their spaces instead of just showing up and getting all this new furniture and being like i don't know how that works i don't even want that get it out of here i'm gonna shove it over to the side and just like not look at it anymore um but i think yeah definitely using the tools that are sort of really easy to kind of pick up even in a summer and just seeing how that can affect your, um, your different learning configurations and how your students are behaving in your space. How about you, Emily? Um, I guess I would add to that when we're, when we're back to the movement piece and we talked a little bit about the movement furniture. Um, there's a lot of other things that I think we can be thinking about as far as movement is concerned in schools. Um, and you know the the having an area where the kids can do a movement break or um you know i've seen people that have sensory hallways uh i don't know if you've seen that laura where like they have like the stickers and stuff on the floor Mm -hmm. and the kids can go through this kind of like a little i don't it's not really there aren't really any obstacles but it's kind of like an obstacle course where they can like pretend they're on the balance beam and they can push against the wall and that these things are you know they're they're all designed by ot's so they're they're working on the the various um you know, sensory systems in the body and helping them, um, you know, they're actually helping them recognize that this, when I do this, it helps me calm down. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so uh, there are a way that, you know, they can be learning how to self-regulate and and what they need. And, um, you know, I I think about uh, middle school kids when my, when my daughter was in middle school, she came home and she was like, mom, 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 they had, they had a study hall. But it was in their orchestra room. Mm. And she was like, Mom, do you know what the boys do during study hall during, in the orchestra room? And I was like, you know what? And she said, they climb up the lockers, the, um, <laughs> the, uh, the instrument storage lockers. Mm-hmm. She's like, they're climbing up them and they're like throwing stuff around. And it's like, well, they they need to move. They need that feedback. They need that movement break. So how can we be organizing our schools so that they could get that um, 
you know, whether they're, they got a free period, they can go to the gym or, or, you know, just realizing that they're not misbehaving Mm -hmm. so much as they're trying to fulfill a need. Yeah. Like how do you give space to make that happen Mm -hmm. in a predictable Mm -hmm. and safe place? You know, students are going to find a way to move in, in their own way, uh, whether you like it or not. So giving it a space where it's easily supervised, safe to do limiting liability as much as possible, (laughs) I think is a, is a good, good point. (laughs) Well, I appreciate you guys coming in and talking about this topic. I, I, I think it's just, it, it is super relevant because um, a, as you're telling those stories, I, I'm thinking of, of other stories. I'm actually thinking back to the guy who was moving, who, who yeah. was in that conference room, <laughs> back and forth. And, and I just keep thinking about it of like, you know, like that movement, you know, 10 years ago or whenever would have been considered off task and mm-hmm. teachers would get really frustrated if exactly. like, you know, like they wanted that. But when you start doing that, well, there's that movement, but it, it's actually, if you watch the kid's eyes when they're doing that, they are, they are locked in. And yep. even if they're not mm-hmm. looking, it is amazing how much they, they just absorb or sink in when us as adults sometimes think they're not paying attention. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Who among us has not had your five-year-old come back with things like, I did not know you were listening to that. Yeah. 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 (laughs) You looked like you were zoned out. Yeah. Yeah. They, they are catching a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, awesome. Well, thank, thank you for joining. I'm sure these are conversations will we'll continue. Um, it, it's what I like about doing the show and being able to, you know, like see these, these conversations, but then bringing them like into real life too. I'm sure I'll see yeah. you guys at conferences and things like that. So I appreciate your time to the listeners. If you enjoy conversations like this, um, please hit subscribe wherever you're listening and go to betterlearningpodcast.com. That is our hub for everything. It's where we get a lot of our ideas. So if you have suggestions, please go there. If you have people you would, you would want to be on the show or you'd want to hear from, or if you, you'd want to be on here, that's, that's a place where we get our, our, uh, our suggestions and we review them in our production meeting. So Laura, Emily, great meeting. And thanks for joining. Thank you so much. This is great. Thanks for having us. The views and opinions expressed on the Better Learning Podcast are those of myself as an individual and my guests and do not necessarily represent the organizations that we work for, the Association for Learning Environments, K-12, Education Leaders Organization, or Second Class Foundation.